Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, joining us and welcome to Weill Hall, the home of the Ford School of Public Policy. I'm Tom Ivaco with the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry if uh, I couldn't hear me quite there. I'm uh, Tom Ivaco with the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. It's better known as Close Up, one of the research centers here in the Ford School. My pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with a few notes about the format of our event. We have time at the end for questions, so uh, please write your questions on the index cards that have been handed out. If you need another one, just uh, flag uh, a staff member, Don Bonney, uh, in the back here. We'll be keeping an eye out. Uh, we'll collect those starting at about 4.30 or so. Uh, and for those of us uh, joining online uh, through the live web stream, please tweet your questions using, using the hashtag policy talks. We'll transcribe those questions onto the cards here ourselves. Uh, joining us to present the questions are a few of our students. Uh, first is uh, Kristen Richardson, uh, joined by Lily Alexander. Uh, they will uh, ask the questions to uh, our speaker today, and they'll be assisted by uh, another uh, University of Michigan student, uh, Michael Wolf, who will be assisted by uh, Sarah Mills, uh, our uh, Senior Project Manager at the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. Uh, Sarah has been uh, leading an effort on campus to bring together faculty, staff, and students from across the campus to uh, look at issues across the urban-rural divide. Uh, but they're taking a particular approach, which is a little bit different, looking at these more along a spectrum uh, as opposed to conceiving of them as across a divide. 
Uh, Sarah will close our uh, event today with a couple of notes about a, a following event. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank uh, Bonnie Roberts, uh, our events manager, for pulling this all together for us today. As always, a great job. Thank you, Bonnie. So today's talk is about listening to strengthen democracy. It's co-sponsored by Close Up and the Ford School uh, as part of the school's initiative on conversations across difference. Uh, I think we all uh, can feel the strain that our country is under today with uh, hyper-partisanship and tribalism really plaguing our politics and uh, in many ways defining a lot of our biggest social challenges. Uh, in this uh, difficult time, the Ford School is committed to uh, playing a leading role in rebuilding a public discourse that is nonpartisan, evidence-based, and inclusive. Uh, we host public events that model reasoned and evidence-based debate and that explore issues around identity and difference. Uh, we develop new student programming and curriculum to train our students in how to bridge difference, productively discuss contested topics, and negotiate. We practice trust building through uh, problem solving and procedural innovations that test and evaluate new methods for learning, listening, and solving problems across difference. And we uh, foster a generous sense of community uh, with our students in the classroom and uh, among our broader community overall. The Ford School has a, a deep mission-driven commitment to the values of scholarship, respectful dialogue, and inclusive community. Our graduate and undergraduate students are training to be civic and national leaders, and we aim to uh, help them develop the ability, uh, as well as the broader public, to make progress on difficult problems through uh, constructive dialogue and action across divides. Uh, and so today's talk by Kathy Kramer is a perfect fit for these efforts. Uh, we're proud to note that Kathy earned her PhD in political science from Michigan. She is the uh, Natalie C. Holton Chair of Letters and Science and Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she's also a senior advisor at Cortico, a nonprofit that works with MIT's Laboratory for Social Machines to foster constructive public uh, discourse uh, among the public, but also uh, among the media to help us uh, develop a, a better understanding of one another. And she, she'll talk about some of this work today. Uh, Kathy's work focuses on the way that uh, people in the United States make sense of our politics and of their place in it. Uh, she's an award-winning author and is known for an innovative approach to the study of public opinion in which she uh, introduces herself into conversations of uh, groups of people to listen and, and uh, get a better understanding of how they make sense of public issues. Uh, she's the author of an outstanding recent book, uh, The Politics of Resentment, which uh, makes use of this kind of unconventional approach and uh, which helps make sense of some of the most important cleavages that are dividing the country today. Uh, so rather than uh, take any more time uh, from Kathy's talk, uh, you can read more of her uh, really impressive bio in your program or on our website if you're online. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, please join me in welcoming Kathy Kramer. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Bonnie Roberts, thank you so much for all of the logistics. I, I, she's sort of an amazing person. If you don't know Bonnie and you need organization in your life, I would say talk to her. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I, I've only been here a few hours, but I've had a fabulous visit. So thank you so much. And thank you, Tom and Sarah. Thank you. And yes, I am a very proud graduate of the political science department here at Michigan. And I just want to give a shout out to Don Kinder, whom I see in the room, a dear friend who very early on taught me the value of studying the things that you care most about in the world. And you'll see in short order, I'm going to tell a series of stories. You'll see in short order that um, I was very fortunate to study political science here because it was an environment in which I learned all of the cutting edge skills and I also learned the value of pursuing ideas that I cared about and that were important in the world and the methods by which I did that were less important than studying important things. 
And um, I owe a lot of that, uh, just the courage to do that to Don, who um, supported me from very early on. So let me tell you some stories. I, when I was a, a college graduate student here, I was fortunate to get involved with Kent Jennings, who was a professor here at the time, and just recently retired from the University of uh, California, Santa Barbara. And Kent, across the course of his career, had been engaging in this study that is generally known as a study of political socialization. In 1997, when I was a graduate student, I was involved with that project. And it was the fourth wave of this study, which was a study of people who were high school seniors in 1965, and then they were followed over the course of their life. And part of my job was to interview some of these folks um, in rural areas of the Deep South. And so I was doing um, uh, basically a caddy survey, so a laptop-based survey in people's homes, and asking them questions like this. This is one of the more famous Michigan questions about partisan identity. Very straightforward, you know, generally, do you consider yourself a Democrat, Republican, or what? Um, sorry, de Republican, Democrat, Independent, or what? And then people would tell us, and we'd re record the answers in, in our laptops. And at the time, a lot of the work was done on paper. So you had to fill out some paperwork and send it back to the Institute for Social Research here, um, the, or the Survey Research Center. And I was spending a lot of time in post offices. So places like this, um, mailing these things back. And in rural communities of the Deep South, as in many smaller communities across the country, post offices are a really important hub of the community because most people have post office boxes and they stop in about once a day. Maybe it's changed over time as surface mails become less a part of our lives, but people stop in and get the news and move on. And I was really interested in the conversations I was encountering in those places, as well as the conversations I was having with these survey respondents after the survey was over. And so from pretty early on in my life as a political scientist, I knew I was interested in conversation and I knew that I picked up a lot about their lives and about the way they understood politics from listening to them talk with one another. And so again, I owe a lot of credit to this university for saying, yes, that's an interesting thing, and yes, we support you in studying it in whatever way uh, you think is useful. So fast forward a bit, across the course of my career, this is basically the question I've been pursuing is, how do people understand their world? And what's behind this is this recognition by many of us that you can expose people, two different people, to the same message, the same speech, the same campaign ad, and they will come away with two different readings on it, two different interpretations. They'll see different things, hear different things. What is that? How does that happen? It happens because we all have different lenses through which we see the world and through which we filter things and process them. I have found, and just in different ways I've been pursuing this question, and I found it much more rewarding than uh, this question, which, which is basically, how can people be so stupid? How can people vote against their interests? What is wrong with them, right? Instead, I like to ask not what are people getting wrong, but how are they getting it? Which leads me to 2007. I had just earned tenure at the University of Wisconsin, and I told myself, okay, now you can do the study you always wanted to do, which is drive around the state that you love, Wisconsin, invite yourself into conversations, and listen to, try to understand the way social class identities matter for the way people are making sense of politics. So this is Wisconsin, just a brief background here. The blue areas are more urban areas in the state, and you'll see just very quickly, it's a pretty rural state. Roughly half the population lives in what most um, assessments of ruralness would consider to be a rural or a small community. What I did, I was interested in social class identity, so I told myself I'm gonna sample a bunch of communities across the state that vary in terms of socioeconomic background. And then I'm gonna invite myself into conversations in each of those places, assuming that the conversations I come across will vary in the social class background of the participants. So these are the places that I sampled. And what I did was to ask people in the know, I'd say in such and such Wisconsin, where can I go where people regularly hang out that I might get access to and then invite myself in. So I went to a lot of places like this. This is a diner. 
Um, I went to a lot of gas stations. Typically, these were places that where people were meeting in the morning before work or they were retirees and it's a way to get out of the house in the morning. I'd walk in, invite myself into the conversation by saying, hi, I'm Kathy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Do you mind if I join you this morning? And they would look at me like I was slightly, you know, <laughs> odd, which I am. Um, and they'd say sure and invite me in and I would visit with them I'd ask them some very open-ended questions and generally just try to listen and watch how the flow of the conversation went um, and then I'd go back the next year and a year after that and basically that that project in about a year turned from being a project about social class per se to a project about what I was hearing or understood to be a rural versus urban divide because I had sampled many different kinds of communities across the state and and uh, because of that ended up spending a lot of time in smaller places rural communities and I was really surprised by what I heard in those places so what I heard became this book which I'm going to briefly explain to you now and then I'm going to tell you stories about where that has led me since 2016 so what I heard I call rural consciousness which is this sense of a strong identity is we're, we're people from a smaller town um, where we're rural folks very rarely did people say anything like that. They'd say things like people around here, people in places like this, or you all down there in Madison, things like that. And so it was this, identity, this sense of we're a, of a certain kind of people and we are on the short end of the stick time and time again in three main ways, in lots of ways, but I kind of categorize them into these three. One is, you know, all the decisions that affect our lives are made down there in Madison or in Milwaukee, which are the two metro areas in the state, the only two, and they're communicated out to us. We don't, people don't come out here and ask us what we think. We're told what the rules are going to be. So we, we're on the short end of the stick in terms of power, basically, in terms of political power and decision-making power. We're also on the short end of the stick in terms of resources because, you know, all of our taxpayer dollars get sucked in, they would say, spent on Madison or Milwaukee, and we don't see that money in return. And the third way is we are also on the short end of the stick in terms of respect because you all making the decisions down there, you don't know us, you don't know what life is like in a place like this, you don't like us and you don't respect us. You think we're racist and sexist and homophobic and Islamophobic and again, they wouldn't use those words, but it came out in, in different phrases. So that's sobering in and of itself. I think it's important in and of itself, but as a political scientist, it seemed to me politically really important. This is a set of sentiments that a savvy politician might tap into, right? In the following ways. So I call it resentment because it has these many different layers to it. You might have heard some of them already just in the way I'm explaining it. So it's resentment towards cities and city people, but it's also resentment towards elites, right? And it's also resentment towards one political party more than another, perhaps increasingly so since the time I was in the field, early 2007. Um, and it's also racism or resentment against um, racial and ethnic minorities. Wisconsin, you may be familiar with this, is very segregated racially and so when people are talking about the cities, oftentimes it's also a conversation about race. So these many different layers mean a politician can ignite or make salient one part of this and activate the other components of it. So it's potentially really powerful. So it sets the stage for divisive messages to clearly carve out for people who's the us and who's the them, right? Because people are, were telling me in many different ways, look, we are working really hard to make ends meet. We are good, hard-working Americans, and it seems to us that our hard-earned money is going to support people who aren't as deserving, aren't as hard-working, whether it be you, Kathy, you're a full-time professor down at University of Wisconsin-Madison. What are you doing driving around the state having coffee with us? Right? How is that hard work? Right? Or sometimes they'd say to me, when do you take a shower? And I'd say, well, before I go to work? Exactly, they would say. I work so hard that the first thing I do when I get home is take a shower. 
and they would just have this sense like there's hard workers and then there's you all who sit behind desks, right? And it seemed to them that a lot of their money was going to pay for people like me. And that's just one example, because sometimes the deservingness was racialized, right? They'd have in their heads the stereotype of a welfare recipient, someone who didn't deserve um, the public benefits that they were receiving. Another way in which this was very ripe ground for a politician to tap into is that it sets the stage for someone to say, yeah, let's have less government. Because people would look around at their communities and say, whatever government is doing, it is not working for us. It's not working for people in places like us. It's not working for people um, like us. And it, there's this sense that government folks were people who didn't respect people in these smaller communities. There's a sense that government in general was an urban thing. So even for public employees living right there in the community, for example, um, public school educators, people would sometimes say things like, look, you know, yeah, I know he's lived in the community for the last 25 years, but you know, the, all the, the testing, the decisions about curriculum, all that stuff is decided by you all down in Madison, not by people here. And whether or not that's true, there was this perception that public employees, the way they do their jobs, were driven by urban values and urban decisions. So lo and behold, um, 2010 rolls around and Scott Walker comes on the scene. Now mind you, he had been on the scene in Wisconsin for some time. He was Milwaukee County Executive. And he ran for governor and won. And shortly after he took office, he proposed this piece of legislation called Act 10, popularly known as Act 10 in Wisconsin, which was kind of a budget addendum. And it was a budget repair bill that included this provision to basically undercut public employee unions. It made it um, very difficult for public employee unions to, to, to um, organize and bargain. And also it required public employees to pay in more of their paychecks for pensions and health care benefits. This picture is a reaction in Madison, how people rallied around the state capitol in Madison. It seemed to be the most unpopular piece of legislation ever proposed in the state. But 20, 25 miles outside of the city, the conversation, the behavior was very different. Instead, people were saying things not like, let's you know, impeach the guy, but it is about time. It's about time someone came, to, came along and made those people pay in more, more to the pot. So that was all very sobering for those of us in Wisconsin and those of everybody watching from other parts of the country. And then the 2016 presidential election took place, right? And people started wondering wow, uh, what is going on in rural Wisconsin? Those of you watching returns on election night 2016, right, as the lines on the New York Times chart cross and you realize Donald Trump would be our next president and Wisconsin was, you know, in the middle of the night, uh, with the last state um, uh, to, to clinch the election for Trump. And it seemed pretty quickly that what, whatever was happening in Wisconsin had some parallels to other parts of the country as well. And Donald Trump is a very different politician than Scott Walker, but in his own way was saying to people, you are right to be so upset. You are doing things as you should. You are hardworking. You are a good American. And uh, what you deserve is going to other people or those people. And for Scott Walker, the target of blame was basically public employees. That wasn't necessarily Donald Trump's target of blame. Instead, he was pointing the finger at immigrants and Muslims and uppity women and liberal elites and such. But in their own ways, they were kind of playing into the same uh, set of sentiments. Now, I don't want to convey that it was um, rural Wisconsinites or rural Wisconsin or rural Americans who were the, the kind of um, uh, pivotal population group in the election of 2016. But um, they were important to the outcome of that election. And uh, my goodness, they've received a lot of attention <laughs> since then, right? One thing that happened to me, just personally, I thought I was 
studying a, a corner of the world that I cared a lot about and uh, election, that election changed my life pretty much overnight in terms of who was asking me to share my knowledge and um, asking me to commentate on, on the world around me, including one of my, uh, one of my favorite stories is as my, I sort of, as the returns are coming in the election night of 2016, I turned to my daughter who's now 12 and I said, I think we should go home. I think I'm gonna be busy tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm checking my email before we went to bed and there's an email from the New York Times saying, hi, we're the New York Times. We think we missed something. Can we talk to you tomorrow? And so that, that was just the start of sort of a lot of people saying, what the heck is going on in Wisconsin and what can you help us understand about rural America? Part of what happened was many people around the country and around the world, but primarily from the United States, wrote messages to me, primarily by email, saying, sometimes asking questions, but more often than not just expressing things to me. Sort of they had heard me speak or read something that I wrote and felt compelled to tell me what was on their minds. And I'm turning to those messages next to help um, convey, I think, the importance of perspective. So what I learned from doing this work is that listening, taking the, having the luxury of taking the time to going to people and sitting down with them and listening to the way they talked about politics opened my eyes to all kinds of things that I hadn't even thought I, I hadn't been looking for. So one thing in particular, um, you know, the, the, the way in which people were turning to me and say, can you help me explain, just taught me that we really don't know much about the perspectives that people are using to think about politics um, in rural America, but in many different parts of our society. It's not just rural Americans who are feeling as though they're unheard and not um, seen or they're overlooked or disrespected. I mean, many people in different components of our society express those same sentiments. And it is true that as social scientists or just as political observers, we often are asking this question, so how can people think that? Right? We want, there's part of us that wants to know more. How are they understanding the world? It helps to listen to people talk to people in their own lives um, to, to get a better sense of that. It also taught me that um, there's more to know about political leaning, people's political leanings, obviously, than their partisanship. Because oftentimes, I would ask people, um, so tell me, which party be best represents the interests of people around here? And almost always, without skipping a beat, people would say, well, neither party. Like n none, none of them are paying attention to us. And, and their, their attachment to the parties was um, much more complicated than a, a leaning towards a uh, Republican or Democrat, but it, it was intertwined with this sense of um, wariness of the parties that um, I, it helped to listen to the way they talked about the parties to understand that. And finally, I just wanna note that one thing I think these conversations did for me was to see the complexity of the way when people are talking about those people and who's deserving, that the way economics and racism or cultural anxiety, whatever we want to call it, are intertwined in the way people are perceiving candidates and, and policy. So I'm turning now to these letters to dive into why listening is valuable a bit more. I'm gonna share with you some of the um, words that I received, I think these are all from email, from people who were reading stuff I wrote or hearing things that I wrote and responding basically to the people I had been studying. So primarily people who we assume um, voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. They'd said, say things like, you know, I don't know what they're paying attention to, but this seems, seems to be from another universe. Or they'd say things like, don't they get that they're getting government support too, that they're getting government benefits themselves and how is it that they wanna undercut government and why, why Scott Walker, why smaller government? Or sometimes they'd say things like, um, um, you know, they, they have the opportunity to move, they can move to where the jobs are. Basically the people in those communities are the people who've been left behind and they're just kind of wallowing in their own resentment. Harsh. 
right? What's really harsh though and really troubling to me is all that stuff sounds so much like the comments that I heard Trump supporters saying about whom they presumed to be Clinton supporters. So I want to share those with you now. Sorry to make you even more depressed. Um, so for example, I'd hear oftentimes that the Democrats, they just cannot decide for themselves. Like they are just being fooled, hoodwinked, whatever you want to call it. Like this one guy is saying, you know, this, this one Democrat, he said basically even if Hitler ran for president, he would vote for him just because he's a Democrat. Like they cannot make their own choices. Or here's another um, set of things. Like they would say things like, you know, um, not just voting on the basis of partisan identity, but they just vote for Barack Obama because they're black. Or they just vote for Hillary Clinton because she's a woman, right? Or they'd say things like, um, you know, the only reason people vote for Democrats is that they're on, they're on some kind of government program and they just want the money to continue flowing. Or they'd say they're hypocritical. And oftentimes this would come up around when I'd go back after the 2016 um, campaign to some of these groups and say, um, well, it would come up be in a way it hadn't before the campaign, who did I vote for? And I would say Hillary Clinton. And they would say, why? And I'd say, well, you know, I saw that videotape, Access Hollywood, I have a daughter. And they say, yeah, 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 but Bill Clinton, how is that any different than what Donald Trump had been doing? They're hypocritical. You know, they, they criticize Trump for behaviors that they don't criticize in their own people. Um, Another thing um, that would come up is just the level, like a perception of Democrats being intolerant. So this person's talking about how, you know, you try to have a conversation with them, doesn't matter what you say, like you just, you're just totally wrong. They won't listen to you. Right, so okay, now that I've thoroughly depressed you, what's so troubling to me about this is there's all this energy being spent on what is wrong with each other what needs to be fixed in those people, right? On the flaw, we're focusing on the flaws of each other, as opposed to focusing maybe on the things that are more fundamentally wrong, which is like, why is it that um, our attention is drawn to what's wrong with each other? Why is that the conversation? And what, what happens is that, um, we get so frustrated with one another, right? And we think um, that the problem is those people and clearly they are not paying attention to the right news or any information you give them will not change their mind and so it's hopeless. And so we throw up our hands, we turn away, we don't engage, we don't get involved. And the result is that the policies that are getting us to these places, whether we're talking about economic policy or otherwise, continue. And so the people in power have the ability to continue passing legislation that actually isn't helping the people who are complaining about the state of affairs. So I'm wondering these days, is the question, you know, what is wrong with these people or those people? Or instead, should we be asking, what is wrong with our overall system? What is wrong with the democracy that we are in the state of affairs that we are in? And we can ask, so what is it that we need? Or probably a question that's more familiar to a lot of you, the question that I've been asking myself since the campaign is, what is it that I should be doing with my talents at this point in time? Given our state of affairs, what do I do to try to contribute to some kind of a solution? So in the remainder of my remarks, I want to share with you one thing that I've been working on since, uh, I guess, early 2017. And this is uh, a project I've been working on with um, a colleague, a person who's become a dear friend. His name is Deb Roy. He's a scientist at MIT. And he, he's a director of this lab called the Laboratory for Social Machines. And they've created a, a nonprofit organization called Cortico, which is helping them deploy the things that they invent. So they're at the MIT Media Lab. And basically, the Laboratory for Social Machines is a group of designers and computer engineers and natural language processing people, machine learning folks. And what we've come up with is basically our answer to how do we scale up 
the listening that I did in Wisconsin on a, on a national scale, perhaps international, we'll see how it goes. But this is where our, our conversation, Deb and I, are, started uh, along this recognition that the way in which we communicate with each other, whether we're talking social media or through traditional media, typically it's loud and shallow and divisive and reactive and it's just not nuanced and it's often disconnected from the things that we, are, that we care about in our, or in our everyday lives. So if you go to a friend and say, so what are your biggest concerns these days? More often than not, it's not going to be the stuff that's getting talked about in the news, but instead it's going to be jobs and paying off your school loans and health care, uh, maybe the environment. What we're aiming for is a kind of communication in which we lift up the voices of people who are underhood, underheard, people who don't feel listened to, um, people who feel as though they are overlooked or disrespected or ignored. Communication that's more nuanced, so as opposed to putting us into boxes or in corners, instead enables us to see the complexity of each other's views and to not simply say, oh, he's one of them or he's one of them and is also just much more grounded in our everyday concerns. So we've come up with this thing we call the Local Voices Network. And here's our mission statement. It's basically the attempt is to foster constructive conversations in communities and in the media that helps us understand one another better. We are basically aiming for simply a way in which we can listen to one another and understand the perspectives of people who are unlike us or don't live near us or we, that we haven't had interaction with. We have grounded our work in these five values, and I'll just say them briefly. This is the, we keep these front and center in all of our design decisions. The first one is we're trying to get people to talk about their stories, about their personal experiences, as opposed to their bullet points. We want people to come into a conversation and share their lives rather than their arguments on the understanding that it's when um, you have the opportunity to hear other people's stories that you can actually understand their lives better. Another way of putting it is, if you bring people into a conversation and say, we're going to have a conversation about climate change, people are going to show up with their, their points in mind, their bullet points, their arguments in mind. And as soon as you sit down in that conversation and people start to talk, you will know who is on which side of what. And more likely than not, your defenses are going to go up. And um, you won't hear. You won't actually listen to what other people have to say. So we're trying to foster people talking about their stories. We're also trying to engage as many different types of people as possible, primarily for the purpose, of, again, of lifting up the voices of people who aren't normally heard in a so-called public conversation project. We're grounding our work in the particular communities in which we're trying out um, the Local Voices Network. So um, every place we are, we are working with the community, asking people, what is it that you want communication to look like in your community? How do you think this should work here? And tailoring it to, to each um, community as we go. And we're trying to be as transparent about it as, as possible in terms of all of our design decisions, where the money's coming from, what we're doing with the data, um, where the data are going. Because we're merging people and technology here. And that hasn't gone so well in recent years uh, in many aspects. And finally, we want it to matter. We hope to have measurable impact. So these are a few of the key things we're focusing on as we try to keep these values front and center and create this, this new public conversation network. Again, we're trying to lift up the voices of people who aren't normally heard. We're trying to get people to listen and learn across boundaries. You can see a great deal of affinity for the work you're doing here. Um, and again, we're trying to get people to share their own stories, their personal concerns. So we call it a public conversation network because at the core are small group conversations, much like the kind I was encountering in gas stations and diners where we're aiming for about six people to be led in a conversation by a facilitator. All these folks are volunteers from the community. Um, and it's public in that the conversations are recorded. Everyone knows they're recorded. They know they're going to be recorded from the moment they volunteer to participate. And then the conversations are shared across a community, across neighborhoods in a community, and across geographic space. 
this is possible through the technology that the folks who are working with at the lab and in Cortico have invented. So it's a scalable technology platform, which is tech lingo, not, not so familiar to me, meaning this. They've invented this thing called the digital hearth, which is this piece of wood with technology inside that's about this size, about the size of a hug. And what's inside of here are, is an array of microphones, eight microphones, a Raspberry Pi computer, which helps uh, enables this thing to communicate with its controller, which I'll show you in a moment, as well as a speaker. So during the conversation, which is very open-ended but yet structured, which I'll say more about in a, in a minute, um, the host or facilitator can pause everyone and say, okay, you all have been talking about affordable housing. I want you to pause for a moment and imagine that there's other people in the room with us. I'm going to play you a conversation from, say, Wapaka, Wisconsin, in which people were talking about affordable housing. And just imagine they're here with us, and once you hear um, the conversation, then we can reflect on it together. And so through this thing, we can bring in voices from other people whom these folks may not have encountered before. But here's what it looks like sitting on a table. The controller is basically an iPhone, but we've put it in a wooden box so that it doesn't feel like someone's phone on the table during a conversation. Um, these are the, the principles that guide the script or the guide that the host used to, to uh, guide the conversation. But basically, the conversation goes like this. Share your first name, tell us a value that's important to you and that is related to why you're here today. Then tell us a story from your background that helps us understand the person you've become. Um, tell us what do you love about living here? And then what are you concerned about in this community? And then let's listen to a voice from another place. And then what do you wish would be five, different five years from now? And then what do you wish your elected officials knew about your life? And finally, what's one thing you're going to be taking away from this conversation? So simple questions that so far have really sparked some thoughtful conversations and about a wide variety of, of issues. So we're not telling people what to talk about. Part of the idea is people uh, have the power to set the agenda, to say what's important in their communities. So it's, we call it community-powered understanding because it's volunteer-driven. It's, it's in particular um, geographies. We started in Madison because that's where I live. This is a group of people training to be facilitators in Madison. Um, you can see the hearth at work here. Um, and we've also been working with the libraries. They're a huge part of the Local Voices Network. So these hearths, these digital hearths, live in the libraries, meaning that's where they get recharged, that's where the data from the conversation gets uploaded to a cloud, um, and also the libraries help us do some recruiting. But importantly, and by design, these things can go anywhere. So librarians taught us early on that if you really want to engage a wide variety of people, you need to go to them, right? Which I think I had learned as well, that if you really want to listen to people and understand how they think about their community, you need to go to where they are in the course of their everyday lives. So these things are portable. They can go to where people are, and then um, they come back to the library. But here's just some shots from the library in Madison recruiting folks um, that they're tagging the, the hearth so they circulate just with the books. Um, here's our very first hearth checkout by a host who owns a pancake restaurant. She's very excited about it. Took it back to her restaurant, had a conversation, and to the much chagrin of the engineers, someone placed a cup on top of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which doesn't happen as, as, uh, if, uh, as far as I know. But okay, so all this data, right, then what? Part of the idea is people encounter different points of view through the conversation itself, through the speaker playing parts of a conversation. But also there's this great web interface that if you're a participant, you can then log on and hear and see your own conversation, but also hear and see the conversations of other people. And you can easily search through and find conversations about a particular topic. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what this website looks like. This is the, the website for Madison. Um, uh, when you open it up, there's a map and the bars show you where conversations have taken place and how many. Um, along the side there are just snippets of different conversations. I'm going to dive into one particular conversation here. It's that the blue spot is the, where it took place. When you open up a given conversation, there's this um, 
bar that shows up that shows you who has participated along the left here. And then across the top are sort of keywords that pop up. So there's, it's showing you what's getting talked about where in the conversation. So here you can see that's where shootings was mentioned. That's where the school district was mentioned. Teachers, Supreme Court, um, immigration was mentioned there. Then you can dial down and say, here's one highlight from a conversation. So highlights are created by volunteers as well, as well as by me and people who are fascinated in the conversations. You can click on one part of it and hear it. I don't have the audio um, link to this right now. And as you, as it plays, it highlights the words that are being said so you can follow along visually pretty easily as well as hear the person's voice. But say you just want to see the full transcript. You can click on the transcript, read through the full transcript, and again, at any point, if you want to hear the person saying it, you can just click on it and it'll play the transcript for you. So um, it's all by, you know, it's all an experiment and um, we are improving things as we go. Oh, and that tab up there, I was just showing you that we've now expanded to Boston. New York City, um, Birmingham, Alabama, which is just starting up, so there actually aren't conversations up on the website yet, as well as Appleton and Wapaka, Wisconsin, which Appleton's like a medium-sized city in Wisconsin. Wapaka's a smaller community. And here, what it's showing you is there's also um, a topic index now that just went up maybe a, a few weeks ago that's the result of me highlighting parts of a conversation saying, these are conversations about education and then the machine learning um, folks teaching, <laughs> teaching the machines to look for more conversations about education. And now, so you can go into the page and say, I want to see some conversations about the environment. Show them to me and a little pop up. In other words, there's much more to say here, but it's a pretty awesome tool for being able to search through the conversations. And now what we're working on is how do you meld the human ability to interpret conversational data along with the capabilities of machines and we have a long way to go but um, uh, it's my hope that we can sort of find a way to, to go from me using post-it notes and highlighters and colored pens to using the machines to be able to understand um, conversations about politics on, on a much larger scale than I was able to do in my Volkswagen or my Prius driving around one state. Another important part of this, just to wrap up, is that um, local media outlets are amplifying what's going on in these conversations. So it's one thing to be able for volunteers to be able to log in and listen, but it's another for the local media to be able to say, hey, look, a lot of people seem to be talking about policing in schools. What are they saying? And let me, as a journalist, follow up with that participant and have a more in-depth interview to understand what's going on in, in that person's life or in their son or daughter's life, for example. So this is just one example of an a outlet that we're um, partnering with in Madison. And then these are some of the others that we're working with around the country. So the ultimate hope is that at one point in time, there will be one of these crazy digital hearts in every library. There's 17,000 of them around the country. So we have a ways to go, um, but so far, so good. And um, I, like you, am hoping that there are, there are ways, we can be creative about how we listen, right? We need to be creative about how we listen to one another. And this, I hope, is, is one contribution. So thank you so much um, for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to the questions. So thank you to, to the students for, for feeling them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kramer, for your very interesting and necessary policy talk here at the Ford School. My name is Kristen Richardson, and I am a first-year master's student studying public policy nice here at the University of Michigan. The first question is, how much of the rural resentment is driven by media versus more authentic sources like grassroots sources? I don't know um, is the honest answer. Um, probably. A good bit of it, but it's it's hard to tell. I for um, the work for my book, I did work with a, a graduate student by the name of Dave Lawson, who um, we did a content analysis of local newspapers across the state, going back to the 50s, to try to get some sense of um, 
was this a kind of sentiment in the local news coverage? Like, is there a way in which we could see it in local news? And we really couldn't at all. But that's not to say it's not a part of the media. I mean, I think sentiments like this are a part of political cultures, which come from so many different things. It's what we say to each other, as well as what we pick up from um, news and popular culture, m movies, music, and such. It's, but it's hard. It's hard to attribute it. It's hard to quantify just how much of it comes from the media. Good question. I'm Lily Alexander. I'm a sophomore here at the University of Michigan. I'm here with We Listen, which is a club on campus yeah, that awesome. looks to encourage dialogue across the aisle. And this question is, in Michigan, with a lot of small township governments, there is sometimes talk of consolidating into fewer larger units. But is there benefit to having smaller government units closer to the people in rural areas? Great question. That's a difficult trade-off. I mean, definitely, there's a benefit for people having government close to them so that they know whom to contact. If, if and when they have a grievance or some issue that they, they want attention on, um, and yet so many of our local governments are so strapped for resources that consolidating up just in some respects makes sense economically. But if we're just talking about um, the sentiment of, of feeling heard, um, getting rid of those very local governments does seem a bit dangerous. The next question is, do survey questions that ask if you are a, a Republican or a Democrat get it wrong? Is, it, is that just too simple? Oh, that's a good question. I wouldn't say it's wrong. It's just, it's a partial answer, right? That. I would imagine many of you in the room, if you were asked the question, are you Republican, Democrat, Independent, or what, could pick one pretty easily, and yet there's more that you want to say about yourself, right? Yeah, I'm a Democrat, but blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's a, just an incomplete answer. It doesn't, it's not the whole answer. And yet, you know, it's that, that question continues to be very powerful for predicting how people are going to vote, or how they will stand on certain issues. So it's been a very efficient question for many <laughs> decades now. It's just that there's also there's more to learn about people's leanings toward the parties. If rural American radio newspapers and cable are owned by closely monitored groups, how can we change this information flow? That's a great question. I mean, we, we so clearly need ways of communicating and, and learning about the world around us in which the, the incentive, well, in, in which divisiveness is not profitable. And I, I don't think we've yet discovered what, what those ways of communicating are. For a time, we thought social media was going to enable that, and that hasn't really been a great answer. Um, I guess that's another I don't know. I wish I knew the answer. You talk about getting people to share their stories and communities. How do you plan to extend these discussions across communities? Yeah, so one way is just through this, what we call cross-pollination of having, for example, say uh, a group of people in the Bronx having a conversation and being able to play for them um, sentiments of people in rural Wisconsin, for example, and vice versa. Um, but also, we, we're hoping that, again, like we're trying to convince ourselves to be creative about how we amplify the voices out, out of these conversations through things like podcasts, volunteers creating podcasts from the materials, or perhaps starting our own podcast channel, or um, 
uh, working with public media to bring the conversations to a new community and um, sparking listening across geography in that way. It's kind of, kind of a traveling uh, local voices network. But um, we, don't, we don't fully, we're making it up as we go. I mean, not like by the seat of our pants necessarily, but um, the goal is to span across geography and to, to expose people across geography to different perspectives, and we haven't yet discovered all the ways of doing that. Why use the word resentment in your book title? It is a strong and somewhat negative word, and then they suggest a new title for your book. Which, <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear it. You'd love to hear yeah, it, okay. Yeah, sure. Why not the politics of feeling, quote, one down, end quote? One, what? See, that's why I didn't want... I don't get their new title, but oh. <laughs> the politics well, of feeling one down. Oh, left out. Yeah. Um, well, good, good question. Um, and it's a question I got uh, a lot of after the 2016 election. And so after the 2016 election, when I felt compelled to go back to many of these groups, I wanted to know, I too wanted to know what they were saying, right? And so part of the reason I was going back even before the election happened was I wanted to give all of them a copy or, or so of the book. And so I started to say, so don't hurt my feelings. I mean, don't feel like you're going to hurt my feelings, but tell, well, what do you, how do you feel about the title of the book? Just tell me, really, you know? And okay, you have to take it with a grain of salt because are they really going to tell me they don't like the title? But often what would happen is people would sort of they wouldn't say anything, they would just sit there and they kind of pause and they'd say, well, what do you mean? Like, well, do you, you know, how does it sit with you? How do you, how do you feel about the title? And they'd say, you mean, are we resentful? I'd say, well, yeah, I'm like, well, yeah, we're resentful. So I, um, I don't have a problem with the title. And, and so. <laughs> Nate Silver says the way to the presidency is through rural Wisconsin voters. What are the rural people from Wisconsin saying about the Democratic candidates? I don't know the answer because I've been immersed in creating the local voices network and, and a different project that, um, so I haven't been back to many of these communities, um, not really since the candidates were up and running and, and uh, people have known about them, so I don't know. How far back do you think the politics of resentment go? Hmm. A long time. I mean, so, you know, we could go to ancient Greece. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, you could say on one hand, you know, ever since humans created anything like a city, there's been this rural urban thing going on but to not be so, so flippant about it. Um, I would say since, I would say since the late 60s, early 70s, sort of the mix of um, social movements and changes in our economy, that, that mix of things that is both um, resulted in a downturn in rural economies and also uh, this this sort of cultural backlash against many of the civil r rights movements. Um, that mix of things, I think, has been fuel for the, the kind of sentiments that I heard in the rural, rural communities. How have you accounted for your identity as a white woman in having conversations with rural Americans? Great question. I mean, in, in this kind of work, you always have to be mindful, let me put it this way, that in this line of work, you shouldn't fool yourself that your presence, you can do something to make your presence not matter, right? Like, I'm not just a thermometer going into a community and taking a temperature. I'm a human being entering into relationships with people. And as with any relationship, like who you are, who you even appear to be in the world influences how that person's going to respond to you. So I guess the answer is I think about it a lot. I ask myself, 
would this have been a different conversation had I been a different person? I try to be attentive to that. I will never know for sure what it would have sounded like or looked like had I been a different person, right? But um, there, there are certain, as we move through the world, all of us, we're constantly making those assessments, right? Like my position in the society as a such and such, how is that impacting the, the interaction I just had? or the opportunity I just had, or the, the discrimination I think I just felt. So I try and think about it a lot and write about it um, when I'm reporting my research, when, when I believe it's been relevant to what people have said. As populations are becoming more transient, young folks moving more, comma, having less stable jobs, how will place-based identity shift? Great question. I don't know for sure, but there's been some really interesting research around language and dialects um, that suggests to me that um, place-based identity is going to become more important, at least in the near term. And the research I'm referring to is based on Wisconsin, and it's based on German dialects, which those of you who are specialists in linguistics or dialects may hear in my own voice, um, that it, it was, was spurred by this recognition that the, the internet and the manner in which we communicate, we, we would think that dialects rooted in kind of ethnic identities of immigrant communities from a century ago may be fading away, right? That we would expect that, if anything, we're all gonna start talking more alike one another over time because we're exposed across geography much more than we used to be. But instead what these folks are finding is that if anything, German rooted dialects in Wisconsin are strengthening among younger generations. So I think what's happening is the way we talk is a way we signal who we are in the world and there's a need for some folks to, to express like I am of a certain type of place. and. I think that sense of feeling like you belong or feeling um, like you are of a community that is a human, is, there's a, a human drive for that. And so I don't, I don't know, I think place-based identity will continue to be pretty important, at least in the short term. After doing this research for years, were you as surprised as many of us about the outcome of the 2016 election? Absolutely. I mean, I, I got my PhD at Michigan. I believe in survey research. <laughs> I believe in public opinion polls and that they can give us uh, at least a snapshot of a moment in time. So yeah, I thought Hillary Clinton was going to be the next president. People want to be heard, but do you think they want to listen? Oh, great question. Yeah, I mean, uh, great, I'm saying yes to the question. N yes and no, right? Like, no, I think, honestly, the, the quick answer this moment in time is no, people don't want to listen. Right, how many of you just in the room, don't, you don't have to put up your hand, actually don't put up your hand, you make me feel bad. As I'm talking, you're probably saying to yourself, you know, this listening thing, I'm, I'm so done with people telling me to listen. Like the last thing I want to do is listen. 2020 is around the corner and that is the last thing we need. We do not have time. We need to defeat them, right? Like I'm not, I'm not about listening. I'm about organizing and figuring out how to bring them down. That I think is probably a more common sentiment, which is why I feel the need to be a listening um, evangelist. Is urban elite versus rural folks the biggest divide in America? Say the first part again. Urban elite or like those, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think if we have to choose one, I would say, but, and it's not a clean cut divide, I would say a, the racial divide divides in our country 
are probably is probably this the most profound um, but it's hard to know how to separate that from geography from economics so um, but if I had to pick one I would say race The flow of tax dollars is from urban areas to rural areas. The Senate gives rural voters vastly disproportionate influence. The story you recount from rural folks is just not the truth. There's no citation, so we don't know where this is coming from. So what is the driver for their false narratives? Just give me a moment. OK. I hear what you are saying, and yes, you are right, but I want to show you some pieces of data that will hopefully complicate your view. So this is a little bit of an outdated graph, but this is recovery from the recession, right? If you're a rural person, you may not see this chart, but you may look around you and say, there are no jobs around here. They're telling me the recession is over, there's been a recovery. Where? This is broadband. Band penetration across the country the orange spots are where it is like you're used to here in Ann Arbor where you can actually do business do online learning do anything basically the blue parts are where it's kind of hard <laughs> very hard um, this so these are a few graphs from my book I'm just going to zoom through a, a quick quickly here these are the 72 counties in the state of Wisconsin and what I'm plotting here is the, the taxpayer money that goes to each county. And what you can see here is it's not the case that rural counties are um, disadvantaged, right? So the farther you are on this side, the dot, the more rural you are. Um, it's also um, not the case that rural counties are, are disadvantaged in terms of federal aid. If anything, they're getting a little bit more, right? Which is the question writer, this is the stuff that they're referring to. Like the, when you look on a per capita basis, rural counties in Wisconsin in particular, and not, not any more than other states, but if we're just talking about the people I was listening to, they're not right, right? Like there's more money going to rural folks. Um, I'm gonna go by here though, a little bit, okay. But if you look at median household income in our rural counties, it's lower. If you look at who's like the percentage of people living below the poverty line, it's higher. And if you look at unemployment, it's higher in our rural counties. So what I want to say is, you know, you may say they don't know what they're talking about. They're being fooled. But you can also say they don't, they don't see those charts. They don't know the per capita amount of uh, taxpayer dollars that are coming back to them. What they see is like the conditions around them and they hear who's not able to, you know, get dental care or who just lost a job. And so is the perception that they're worse off than the urban areas incorrect? I don't think it's an easy answer. How do you think the people you met through your research in Wisconsin feel about the title of your book? Do you think that they see themselves as resentful? Yes. With the dominance of the two-party system and the issues of identifying fully with either party, what's the solution? Oh, boy. I, I came up with this question, <laughs> so. Stop me. I, if I had the solution, I don't know, if I had the solution, <laughs> would it matter? Uh, the, what a hopeless thing to say. I mean, it's one thing to have the, the solution, it's another to have the political power to change things, right? So we know gerrymandering might be part of the issue and, you know, I mean, you're, you're in a slightly different context here than many other states in the country where your voters have had the chance to say, yeah, we want something different, right? It's not, yeah, it's not always possible to implement the solution even if you, you know it might help, so. 
We've gotten a couple of questions about Henry Wallace and agricultural extension in the 1930s. How do you think that factors into what we are seeing today? Uh, well, um, extension, I think in extension is immensely valuable. Um, because when we think about our universities in, in particular, and um, in my book I write quite a bit about the way people talked about University of Wisconsin-Madison and the sentiment of, um, you know, you all are down there, you don't understand our lives, you don't listen to us, our kids can't get in. When they do, you don't understand them. Um, the, the, a, a great way to remedy that is to actually have people of the university in the communities living with them, interacting with them, knowing those folks, them getting, you know, creating relationships, which is extension. Like, and when I started my study, I learned, thankfully, that our extension educators around the state are people with very deep knowledge of the communities that they serve. And so it was often the extension office I was calling to say, where in such and such Wisconsin do people go on a daily basis to visit with one another to shoot the breeze? And it's that kind of like rooted, community rooted, daily life information that the extension folks know. I think it's just an extremely valuable part of a university, not just in terms of PR, not just so it looks like we're involved in the communities that our state, our, our universities serve, but so that we can actually learn and hear what is going on out there in the world in these places. We can discover what their concerns are and, and hopefully um, not only improve our research that way, but improve our ability to relate to the students who come and learn from us. Was there a learning curve with your survey technology? Um, it, um, uh, since they're saying technology, I wonder if they're referring to the digital hearth. There, yeah, there's yeah, it's a constant learning curve. Like, and thankfully, it's. So I'm working with this team of engineers, and so by their nature, they're, they're used to and trained in creating things, like pulling together as much knowledge as possible to create something, and then deploying it, and then carefully attending to feedback, and then revising it. And so it's been an awesome experience, and just it's a different kind of learning for me, where it, usually in my previous work, I'd work on something and polish it as much as possible and then put it out there in the world. And these folks, the, the, the sensibility is a little bit different. It's like, get it out there as soon as you possibly can so that we can learn and improve it. So yeah, it's, it's a constant learning curve. I don't know if it's steep, it feels steep. <laughs> what, is the, what is the demographic of voices you're getting? It, well, it depends on the community. Um, in Madison, um, the, the typical participant is, as you might expect, a white, middle-aged, middle-class, relatively well-educated person. But there's a wide variety. There's about 29% um, uh, about of our facilitators are people of color. Most people are, um, most of the facilitators are upper income. The participants, um, it's a little bit harder to say because we have not yet started collecting demographic information on people by choice because we, the philosophy behind the Local Voices Network is we want people to see the nuance in each other and we have not, we've been very reluctant to ask people, we want you to see and hear the nuance in each other but can, now, can you put yourself in some of these boxes for us so that we can better, you know, under, I don't know, make sense of the data. So we're trying to figure out a way to give people a lot of leeway in describing who they are to us and yet capturing the information on who the participants are. So we think that we're capturing um, or engaging a wide range of people, um, but I don't have numbers to share you on what I mean by that, share with you on what I mean by that. 
the technology analytic potentials are neat could it be alienating and limiting in terms of who will use it yeah I mean it's weird right like <laughs> yeah there's so many people who are wary of technology and especially when we say this these things are recording what you're saying right there can be many people who are wary of participating in that so we are that's that's partly the driver behind us trying to be as transparent as possible so trying to make it clear to people where the data are going how we're protecting it um, what the purpose is um, and we recognize I mean it's like good community organizing I guess and that it's we've understand that it's about relationship building about people getting to know what the local voices network is and having an experience in it and developing trust over time as they see what we do with it and what the local journalists do with it and hopefully what um, local policymakers what uh, the, the good use that they can put it to um, so I hear I hear you um, another thing though is that we've been a bit surprised at just how much people do want their voices uh, heard and recorded so on the other hand um, there are many people who say if my voice is going to be heard yes I you, you need technology to amplify it and uh, I'm happy to participate to get my voice out there was it easy to be accepted into certain rigid ideological cir circus yeah. circles Sorry. Um, I don't, they weren't rigid. Like, uh, yeah, I, they didn't, they, it was easy. I mean, it's very rare for people to be asked, do you mind? if I sit down with you and listen to what your concerns are. And my experience is once people know that I'm genuine about that, that that really is why I'm there, I'm not trying to fool them in any way, like I was telling the students earlier today, I'm like, I'm not trying to sell you anything, I'm not running for office, I'm not trying to tell you why you're wrong, as soon as they understand that I actually know my purpose in being there is to listen, people were very welcoming. Um, and I, it didn't, it, I guess it's a longer, longer answer than I have time for, but it didn't feel as though I had somehow magically passed over some threshold and gotten myself invited into an exclusive club. Never felt like that. How have your beliefs changed since starting talking to other people? I think my, my, very rarely, I think, does listening change our beliefs. And I, and I would say that is not why I think listening is important. Instead, what it does is helps you see the humanity in the other people and helps you probably better understand yourself. So if my beliefs have changed, it's been, I think I have a stronger sense of what I value in this world and the kind of human interactions that I think are important and that I strive to replicate or have around me. But I don't think my position I don't think my position on any policy issue has really changed or my own kind of political leanings. I don't think that's what good listening usually results in. When you say you picked up racism in the conversations, can you elaborate? Sure. So the most common way is when um, People are talking about education policy 
and they'd be reflecting on kind of where the school funding formula sends money in the state. Um, people would talk about Milwaukee and, and talk about how, you know, we've sent that city so much money and, and look at those schools, look at those places. And there would be kind of assessments of um, kind of culture of poverty assessments and, um, you know, more money is not going to solve the problem because the problem is the way, um, I'm just not even going to repeat it, but I would say in conversations about education is probably where it was most common and, um, yeah, I'd rather not elaborate on the stereotypes I'd heard. So this is going to be our last question. Can you elaborate on how people at Michigan or in Ann Arbor can get involved? Oh, sure. With LVN? Great. All you have to do is go to lvn.org, uh, send an email, just express interest and say, Local Voices Network sounds pretty interesting. Could we possibly start up a chapter here? Um, you could also, it, it, that would probably take some time. We're expanding. Um, uh, there's, there's no real formula for what it means to open a new chapter, so it might be some time before a chapter would start up in Ann Arbor or near Ann Arbor. But you might volunteer to be a curator, which is a person who goes into the conversations and lifts out highlights and, and kind of writes notes about, I think other people should hear this and here's why. Um, and you can email me, too. Very good. Well, thank you. If you want to join me again in thanking uh, Dr. Kramer for her talk. And if you, like me, want to talk to her more, we are lucky that she'll still be on campus for another couple of days and actually back in this building for breakfast on Friday. Um, this is when the Rural America Working Group that Close Up is part of, that's a, it's a Rackham interdisciplinary group for faculty, staff, students across campus who have interests in uh, research interest in rural America, um, an opportunity to get together, and uh, Dr. Kramer will be joining us then. So there's a couple spots left. It's a small breakfast. Just see me afterwards, and uh, we can add you to the list. So thank you again. Right now, uh, we are ready. There's a reception that we hope you'll join us for right after. Thank you. <laughs>